Join me tonight on Twitch at 11.30 p.m. Eastern after the conclusion of Sunday Night Football, where we'll talk about everything that happened this week in the NFL. And join me Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern to play some live NFL trivia for a chance to win cash prizes. Link in the description below. And now, on with our feature presentation. Teams will do everything in their power to gain a competitive advantage, and especially if they're the home team, they'll try everything and anything possible to disrupt the road team and make life as uncomfortable for them as possible. This ranges from fans being loud when the opposing team is on offense, so that the quarterback can't communicate as easily to his teammates, to structural things like having locker rooms that are smaller and cramped, and having benches that flat out don't work. Some of these attempts to create an advantage are more effective than others, as while some are incredibly effective, some are incredibly, utterly stupid. And this is one of them. In 1969, the Philadelphia Eagles were hosting the Los Angeles Rams, and wanted to do everything possible to make sure that they won the game. What followed was a move that made no sense, involving the Eagles believing in a jinx that was asinine and simply did not exist, and a move that annoyed everyone, from the person involved to the Rams to even the NFL and CBS, the network televising the game. And this is the story behind the stupidest pregame controversy in the history of the Philadelphia Eagles. Before I talk about the incident in question, we need some context to understand who was involved, the importance of this game, and how good the opponent was that the Eagles were set to face. And oddly enough, the main subject of our story with regards to the person most impacted by this was not a player or a coach or a staff member on either side. It was not anyone who had any ties to football, and it was someone who had never played a down of football in his life. Rather, it was an actor by the name of Jim Neighbors. Neighbors was originally born in Alabama, but wanted to pursue a career in the entertainment business and moved to Los Angeles, becoming so successful there that years down the road, he eventually got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. During the 1960s, Neighbors was one of the hottest names in the business. He became a regular on The Andy Griffith Show throughout the middle of the series' run, joining the show at the end of 1962. And that show was one of the biggest in the nation, finishing inside the top 10 of the Nielsen ratings each year that he was on. His character was so popular that he got his own spin-off show, and that spin-off ran for five years and finished inside the top three of the Nielsen ratings in four of the five years that it was on the air. In fact, in three of the five years that Gomer Pyle, USMC, was on the air, it was not only the highest rated show on CBS, but it was rated higher than The Andy Griffith Show. How many spin-offs are more successful than the parent program? It was a testament to his star power, and he was so successful that after that show ended, he got his own variety show, The Jim Neighbors Hour, which once again was so successful that it drew a higher rating in 1969, the time of this story, than the variety shows hosted by stars like Carol Burnett, Dean Martin, Glenn Campbell, Johnny Cash, and even Ed Sullivan himself. But of the many talents that Neighbors possessed, perhaps the one that people best recognized him for was his singing voice. Neighbors had a legitimately great voice. It was so good, in fact, that as Andy Griffith himself recalls, when Neighbors sang at Griffith's Roadshow, he impressed the audience so much that when his set was over and Griffith walked back out on stage, the audience booed because they wanted to hear Neighbors sing more songs. He released a few albums, and while he didn't have any major hits, he did have four albums prior to the time of this story that charted inside the Billboard Hot 200, tracking the highest selling albums in the country. With all that background, you're probably wondering how the heck this relates to an NFL game. Well, in 1969, with Neighbors near the height of his popularity in Los Angeles, the NFL team based in Los Angeles was playing out of their minds. Through the first eight weeks of the 1969 NFL season, there was one team that seemed to be head and shoulders above the rest of the competition. That team was the Los Angeles Rams. They were absolutely dominant, and past the halfway point of the 14-game season, they were still undefeated. Through eight weeks, the Rams had a perfect 8-0 record. They had the second most points in football, scoring 229, which comes out to an average of just under 29 points per game, and was the second most in football, only behind the Minnesota Vikings at 258. They had the third best defense in football, allowing just 129 points, which is just over 16 points per game, and trailed only the Dallas Cowboys at 120, and the vaunted Vikings defense at 82. In every sense of the word, no matter what stat you present, the Rams were good at it. They had the third best point differential in football at plus 100. They had the best quarterback in all of football in Roman Gabriel, who had thrown 17 touchdowns and just one interception at this point. He had a passer rating through eight weeks of 100.3. Keep in mind that the year before, the average passer rating across all of football was 68.3. And here he was, an incredible 47% better than the league average from 1968. Gabriel was so good that season that he would win the MVP, and you can learn more about his career by clicking the card in the upper right corner. They had a suffocating defense that had forced multiple turnovers in every single game. And as crazy as it sounds, they were saving their best football for last. They scored a season-high 38 points in Week 7 against Atlanta, and then topped that in Week 8 with a new season-high of 41 points. 
and defensively, the Rams allowed single digits in two of their three most recent games. The Rams were red hot and were firing on all cylinders. And the next opponent on the schedule in Week 9 was the Philadelphia Eagles. The Rams would be traveling across the country for this one, where they'd be taking on an Eagles team that was a bit of a mixed bag. On one hand, Philly had nothing to play for. They were four games back of the Capital Division lead with six to play, and this was at a time where only the division winners made it to the postseason, so their season was pretty much toast. On the other hand, Philly had gone unbeaten in their last three games, and following a 1-4 start, could get back to 500 if they could pull off this upset win. It seemed like it had the makings of a pretty decent game, and the Eagles were going to do everything in their power, no matter how ridiculously stupid it was, to make it so that the Rams couldn't keep their winning streak alive. During the Rams' winning streak, there was a common theme before all of their games. The man singing the anthem was none other than Jim Neighbors. Now, keep in mind that even though Neighbors was a Rams fan, and had been following the team to every game that they played so far, he was not a Rams employee. He was traveling to each game at his own expense to sing the national anthem before the game. And Neighbors would perform at other sporting events as well. For over four decades, he performed the unofficial state song of Indiana prior to the Indianapolis 500. Just to give you an idea of what his rendition of the national anthem sounded like, as it was pretty consistent across all the appearances that he made, here's a brief snippet of him singing the anthem prior to a Monday Night Football game between the Rams and the Vikings in 1970. Today, the national anthem is not televised for every NFL game. You'll see it televised when a special singer or performer is there, if it's in remembrance of a certain day, or if it's a big playoff game, such as the Conference Championship or the Super Bowl. But back in 1969, the anthem was shown on TV prior to every single game. And the original plan, as was the case for every Rams game so far this year, home and away, was to have neighbors sing the anthem live on CBS. Seems easy and simple enough, right? Neighbors would do what he'd be doing all season, and then the game would commence. This is how literally every NFL pregame goes. You hire someone to do the National Anthem, and then the person does the National Anthem. Except the Eagles realize something. The Rams were 8-0 this year, and prior to all eight of their games, it was Neighbors who sang the Anthem. And just minutes before kickoff, moments before Neighbors was set to take the field to honor America, the Eagles decided that he wasn't going to go on anymore. Because in an absolutely bizarre controversy, the Eagles didn't want him stepping on the field, jinxing the Eagles, and being bad luck for the team. It would be one thing if the Eagles decided that they weren't going to allow Neighbors to step on the field and be shown on television well in advance. If the Eagles decided that they were going to go with someone else, since it's their home game, then that would be fine. But Neighbors was scheduled to do the anthem, and was informed roughly 10 minutes before he was set to go on that he was now no longer going to do the anthem on the field and on TV. The weird part was that he was still going to do the anthem, so it's not like that changed anything. But now he was going to do it untelevised and while standing on the Rams sideline. So what the purpose of doing it this way was, I'm not entirely sure. But the reason for this sudden change? It had nothing to do with the condition on the field, it had nothing to do with technical difficulties on CBS's part, or the anthem being preempted due to other television programming. It was because according to Bill Mullen, the entertainment director for the Eagles at the time, neighbors singing the anthem on the field on television would have jinxed the Eagles, since the Rams were undefeated and hadn't lost in the eight games that neighbors sang the anthem televised. Again, this raises the question of why not just have someone else sing the anthem, but I digress. Understandably, CBS was furious about this, and they were scrambling to figure out what the meaning behind this was. Since they were expecting an anthem to be televised, they had a lot of time for the anthem, they had sold commercial spots around the anthem, and they knew that there were going to be angry people if they didn't televise the anthem. But CBS's hands were completely tied here. When officials asked Eagles general manager Pete Retzlaff why he was making this last-minute change, Retzlaff repeated the same thing that Mullen said, and said that they weren't going to allow Neighbors to sing the anthem on television because it would bring bad luck to the Eagles. Neighbors never said anything negative about Philly. It was just his mere presence that would have brought this on the team. Just the idea that he could jinx them by standing on the field and singing was enough for the Eagles to call the whole thing off, much to the disgust of everyone, especially CBS. So that raises one final question. Did this bold, incredibly stupid plan on Philly's part work? Of course it didn't. The Rams proved to the country that day that they could win and play well without the help of Jim Neighbors, because on November 16, 1969, on a cold 25-degree windchill day at Franklin Field, the Rams prevailed and won it by a final score of 23-17. After trailing 10-0 at the end of the first half, the Rams dominated in the second half, 
scoring 23 straight. Philly struggled to get anything going offensively. They turned the ball over four times, and starting quarterback Norm Snead had a rough day at the office, going 11 for 26 with a completion percentage of 42%, with 186 yards passing, two interceptions, and a passer rating of 47.9. One of those interceptions was a pick six in the third quarter, which gave the Rams their first lead of the day. Los Angeles scored 20 points in that quarter coming out of the halftime break, so whatever halftime adjustments they made clearly worked. I know it's shocking to just about everyone that the Eagles banning the person singing the national anthem from stepping onto the field and performing on television, yet still allowing him to sing the anthem, did not have any impact on the game whatsoever, and did not change the outcome, nor did it stop Los Angeles' winning streak. Anything to gain even the slightest bit of a competitive advantage, no matter how stupid or how ridiculous it sounded, Pete Retzlaff, Bill Mullen, and the Eagles were going to try. Having said that, the fact that they actually tried this stunt and thought it would make a difference might help explain just a bit as to why the Eagles never had a winning record with Retzlaff as the general manager. Obviously, something like this is never going to happen again in today's NFL. Aside from the fact that they don't televise the anthem outside of major events, no team is going to dictate to its anthem singer 10 minutes before game time that they're not allowed to step on the field or sing on television. The singer would not allow that, thanks in part to contract language, there's no way the TV networks would allow it, and there's no way that the NFL would allow it. It's kind of amazing, even back in 1969, that a team had that much power to dictate all of this. Because on this day in Philly, that Star Spangled Banner was waving. Just not on the field or on television. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed out to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JRGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See so how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.